excited to have this panel. They're going to be talking about uh, kind of lessons learned over the last five years in aquifer storage and recovery. All of these folks have worked on a number of ASR projects. Uh, the pa panel is moderated by Neil Deeds. He's the vice president of the southern region of Interra and someone who's been involved in a number of these projects. We're excited to have uh, the whole panel here. I'm going to let Neil introduce his panelists. So, so thanks, everybody. I really appreciate the opportunity to do this. I wanted to just quickly introduce the, the panel. Really appreciate you guys coming and participating in this as well. We have Shauna Fitzsimmons Sledge, uh, attorney with Sledge Law. She's a licensed attorney, obviously, and a registered lobbyist and a partner at the firm. Um, we wanted to do a little fun fact for everybody. Uh, this won't take very long, but Shauna's fun fact was she served the game-winning ace at the high school state volleyball championship game her senior year. Right, my claim the same. <laughs> Go Clark Cougars. Go Clark Cougars. Did you hit the baseline? Did you short serve them? How'd you do it? Oh, it was a top spin. Top spin. All right, sweet. Great to the ground. <laughs> it was 5A before 6A existed. I mean, that's pretty much the pinnacle. If I did that, it'd be the pinnacle. It's only downhill from there. <laughs> and we've got Brian Smith, uh, principal hydrogeologist with the Barton Springs Edwards Aquifer Conservation District. Um, Brian Smith is basically aquifer science team, team leader and principal hydrogeologist. And his fun fact is he's been studying caves, karst, and karst aquifers since he was 15 years old. Brian, that's a long time in Tennessee. <laughs> and so does he still finds excuses to go to caves as part of his work. Does that make you a spelunker? Yes. No. No. We, no. Cavers don't like the word spelunkers. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll. I'll, I'll Withdraw that one then. I was thinking in Tennessee they might say speedlunker. I wanted to make anyway. All right. Then we have Charles Schoening, uh, principal in charge at Arcadis. A lot of you guys know Charles. He's been in the water world a long time. And so he's a central, he's a principal in charge for the Central and South Texas region. Fun fact, I don't know if you call this fun, but he is a recently retired brigadier general, having served 32 years in the Army Engineer Officer. His combat deployments included Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria, and I couldn't think of anything lighthearted to say about that other than that's a hell of a good job, Charles, and uh, that's a heck of a side hustle to become Brig Brigadier General. So that's congratulations on that. Thank you. I agree. And just, I, I had to have a fun fact for myself. Um, I attended one of the handful of one-room schoolhouses in rural Nebraska. Uh, I was the only kid in my class, so for eight straight years, I graduated at the top of my class. <laughs> I never did it again, but man, at that school, I was right there at the top. All right, we were going to have David Smith of CDM uh, on this panel. He has a lot of experience in ASR, but he had a death in the family, so we weren't able to have him participate. So thinking about David today. So what are we going to try to talk about today? Um, we're talking about ASR. Uh, ASR is one of those strategies that's featured prominently in the state water plan. So there's a lot of talk about using it for load leveling, for drought res resiliency, those kinds of things. But when we, you know, if you, if you read a report about ASR that's been written in Texas, basically they mention the three projects that are currently going. That's the very successful Twin Oaks facility down in San Antonio, down in San Antonio. We're actually in San Antonio, sorry, I'm from Austin. Um, the one that's in Kerrville, which has also been successful for many years, and then also the one in El Paso. And what I'm trying to do here is just tell people we have new projects that are going that actually have wells in the ground, we are actually recharging water, and we're doing cycle testing and recovering, and these folks have been involved in those projects. And I think bringing up that awareness hopefully will help kind of promulgate more of these projects to get them from the feasibility level to the actual demonstration level, and at that point, you can do full, full build-out, and now you have a system that really works for you. So for those of you who don't know what ASR is, just simply it is when you have excess water supply, you recharge it through a well, and when you need that water, you pull it back and recover it from the well. It's as simple as that, so aquifer storage and recovery. Um, I should mention that the Water Board just did a statewide study, some of you are familiar with, of looking at how feasible ASR would be throughout all the aquifers in the state. And I think that was a really good study and that's a really good launch off point um, for future projects. So the first part of this is going to 
focused on a background and update on legislative and regulatory activities in the last few years. And I'm going to ask Shauna to really lead that. I mean, she's going to be the expert up here on those types of things. So Shauna, if you just want to start us off there. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm super excited to be part of this panel since ASR is my favorite topic to discuss. I was just telling one of my new board member clients that it's the sexy area of water law, is what I like to think. Um, being a water nerd, I think he said, well, that's relative. Um, so, <laughs> but yeah, so basically in 2015 is when ASR really changed for the state of Texas. We were seeing other states really utilize this kind of technology, but Texas was really behind the curve. And so we took a really hard look at where, from a policy perspective, we could remove some of these roadblocks. And so the TWCA Groundwater Legislative Committee met and put together a small group to spearhead this initiative. And I happen to be on, in that group with some very, very smart folks. So that know a lot, or at that time definitely knew a lot more about ASR than I did. Um, and what was going on in the other states. And so it was interesting to see what Florida and some of the other states um, were doing to utilize this technology. Um, and we worked very, very closely with Representative Larson on this initiative, and then um, it was House Bill 655, and then uh, Senator Perry carried it in the Senate. And it was really great because some of the big things that it did was first and foremost um, take away the pilot, required pilot process. Um, that was an element to getting a permit from TCEQ. Um, while folks that are doing ASR today might utilize a pilot type feasibility type project on the front end, it's not required to get your permit. Um, that was major, major development. Um, we also eliminated the need to have to amend your surface water right to include ASR. That was another huge roadblock. We basically just said, any, if you have any sort of water right, whether it's you know uh, surface water, groundwater, reused water, um, you're all on the same playing field. You just need to get your class five injection well permit from TCEQ. And that also includes the recovery component, which leads me to my next point, which is we took the regulatory power over ASR projects away from GCDs and put it in the exclusive jurisdiction of TCEQ because we were seeing, you know, groundwater districts get a bad rap for having different rules, as we heard from Senator Perry, um, across the state. We didn't want a hundred different ASR rules. Um, and so while groundwater districts definitely play a significant role in ASR, you know, you want to have a relationship with your groundwater district, they are not the actual permitting entity to the extent that you're not pulling out more groundwater than you inject. Now, groundwater districts do receive, um, or they are required, uh, operators are required to register their wells with the groundwater district so that they know where they are. Um, they're required to send groundwater districts monthly reports on production amounts, just like they're sending them to TCEQ already, so we're not having to you know, do additional work, but groundwater districts are part of the discussion and staying informed. And then there's also an annual water quality report that TCEQ receives, and then groundwater districts receive that as well. So it's important to have a relationship with your groundwater district, but groundwater districts, with some exceptions, as Brian I'm sure will speak about, um, groundwater districts do not have regulatory authority over ASR projects. Um, so that was huge. Another huge element we did in that bill was ensure that TCEQ's rules were not more stringent than federal standards. So prior to 2015, the water injected had to meet drinking water quality standards. And now that's changed. Um, and so, you know, you still don't want to contaminate and you want to protect uh, USDW water, but uh, which is 10,000 TDS or less but it doesn't, the injected water doesn't have to rise to the level of Federal Safe Drinking Water Act water. Um, and these guys know a lot more about water quality issues than I do, but there's a lot of really interesting technology to show how you can control uh, pathogens and even arsenic issues um, with monitoring and technology efforts. So 
that's proven to be really helpful in streamlining some of these projects and getting them on board and being more feasible. Um, so that was a huge, huge effort. And then after that legislation passed, we had a long period of working with TCEQ staff. And I cannot commend Charles McGuire, the di director at the time, he's now with EPA, and his staff, Lori Council, on their um, willingness to work with us. I'm sure many of y'all worked with them. 100%. It was awesome. Um, they really heard our concerns, especially, you know, there's some kinks that really had to be worked out. I think there was a little bit disconnect and really overhauling TCEQ's rules to make a robust uh, water policy system and permitting system that uh, promoted this technology. And I'm gonna use the word permit very loosely here. Um, while TCEQ has the authority to do an individual permit or a general permit or authoriz authorization by rule, the route we're doing right now or what TCEQ is doing authorization by rule. So that means that it put into its rule, it adopted rules that lay out the parameters of a ASR project and then you can apply and your application is reviewed and approved potentially by TCQ, but it's not an individual permit, which is also important and streamline that process of getting permits, permits um, handed out because we weren't having these big contested case hearings and that sort of thing on every single applicant coming, coming through. That was huge. So that was all great, um, but there's definitely, you know, we haven't seen a million ASR projects, but we're seeing a lot more. We're seeing them in the water plan, the 2017 water plan. We're seeing a lot more coming online, but they do take time. And I think we're finally seeing the fruits of our labor on that front. Um, then we had another bill in 2019, uh, House Bill 720, which basically a crazy Larson idea that actually panned out, which was <laughs> capturing excess, excess flood flows after that, you know, Hurricane Harvey, we saw so much water being lost to the <clears throat> Gulf and then trying to do an expedited permitting process to inject that water and store it. That's, that's great. I appreciate that, that overview. And it, you, you touched on that in general, you know, GCDs are sort of a, a, an observer in the process, but not a, a permit regulatory authority, and with the exception of, I think, three. So Barton Springs is one of those. EAA is one of those. And so you guys are both having projects in those two areas. I think the third is harris Galveston Subsidence District. Mm -hmm. And they're just starting to kind of get a handle on, on what their permit process would look like for ASR. But Brian, I don't know if you want to just touch on, you know, Barton Springs' role and kind of how you guys are approaching um, your permitting. Yeah, well, yeah, it's interesting us, us as such a small district and how we came about with having some, some authority in regard to, to ASR. And there's probably a lot of little pieces of that that I wasn't directly involved in. Sean and others in the room probably know more about it. But I, I like to think it was because we got a fairly early start, you know, uh, on ASR uh, with our studies going back 15 years and looking at you know, this beyond the Edwards Aquifer, but look, focusing a lot on the Trinity Aquifer. And those studies led us to realize that, well, the Trinity could make a very good repository, reservoir for injected water for, for ASR. So we'd been doing these studies, and as this all was being developed, like think somewhere in there someone recognized that, well, Martin Springs people are, are already you know, involved in this and getting good understanding, and therefore, you know, we were given this some authority and I won't get into all the details, is it's a lot of rules that are there, but I like to think that they largely mimic what TCQ is requiring. So we're not just kind of adding on a whole lot of other requirements. You know, if they're doing, you know, TCQ requires, you know, water quality studies, monitoring the injection and extraction of the water and even looking at water levels and all the testing. So we basically say, yeah, we want that too. So if they're doing a report for TCQ, they send that to us. And you know, there are a few other requirements, and particularly because you know, we permit water from the Trinity, so we're, we're very concerned about if they pump beyond the injected water, uh, then that's water that we're supposed to be permitting. Right. And in some cases, we already have permits or issue permits for that water, but there could be cases coming up where you know, we don't, you know, the, the permittee is not currently permitted, so that would then just go right into ASR and we would look at the situation, see can we permit 
actual extraction of some of that native water, or could there be problems that come, come about from that? Whereas for the most part, we feel like you know, if, it's, if it's potable water down there, they can, they can pump it out, or even if it's marginal, they can still pump it out after they extract their injected water. Even though in most cases, that's not very likely that they would do that. The, the idea of most ASR is to build up a big bubble, you have a wall, so you would never really extract directly native water, but you might extract water that's being mixed. That's been mixed. The mixing is very significant that, in there. That makes sense. And, and I think that Ruby Ranch is the first full permitted ASR project prior to those other three that, that I spoke about. So kind of under the new you know, regulations that Laurier and her crew have put together, you guys are the first ones, or Ruby Ranch is the first one to, to have gotten a full permit. Yes, yes. I like to remind people that, yeah, there are now four. There are four, it's not three ASR anyway, systems four. in the state of Texas, that, and one of which, and I can talk about it a little, a little more detail later about the technical aspects of it, but it is a very small water system, but it, it kind of proved up that, yeah, this does work to have the Trinity as a reservoir for injecting injecting water. That's great. And, and just right down the road, you know, in, in this area of, of Texas, the EAA obviously has a strong, you know, local regulatory authority over one of our most precious aquifers in the state. And so, Charles, your project there for New Braunfels has had to navigate that partnership as well. So can you talk a little bit about that, how you went through that? Right, right. And, you know, the Edwards Aquifer Authority enabling legislation is very uh, prescriptive and restrictive. And so any, it, it outlines specifically what you can and cannot do. So anytime uh, there's something that's not specifically written into that, requires to go back and have a legislative change, uh, which is what we did. We had to go back and uh, have a, a uh, rule passed to allow us to be able to actually store water in that brackish zone. Um, it, and so it requires getting your local legislators uh, involved, and there's a lot of emphasis on ASR. There's a lot of support for ASR, so it wasn't that difficult getting them on board. It's more of an educational um, situation where you have to educate them on what, you're, what you want to do, how it's different, how the bill needs to be written in order to get what you need in order to move forward. I think the other thing too is it, it helps if your local regula regulator is on board with the project. And I will say that EAA is uh, more than on board. They are a party to it at this point. Uh, we approached them about what we wanted to do. Uh, we developed uh, between EAA and NBU, uh, New Braunfels Utilities, uh, an, an interlocal agreement that specifies exactly what's going to happen, uh, very science-based uh, monitoring requirements, um, reporting requirements, uh, all of those things, so that at the end of the day, they could be assured that uh, the Edwards is going to be protected, the, the freshwater Edwards. And so what we figured out is we, they both had similar interests. Uh, New Braunfels is uh, very proud and very protective of the Comal Springs they didn't want to do anything that was going to damage the springs. Um, they invest a lot of money in making sure that the springs are protected and that uh, it, 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 the uh, recreational use of the springs. So at the end of the day, they both had very similar objectives and it was pretty easy for them to get this uh, agreement put in place. And you know, EAA wants to see it succeed. Uh, I think we all do but we want to make sure that we're using the right scientific approach to make sure that we're not doing something good in one area, but creating an issue in another. That, that makes sense. And, and I think that we're, we're hitting our time on that topic, so we're going to move on. I really appreciate your input on that. So I wanted to just quickly talk about the, we often talk about a phased approach to ASR, um, and that's the one slide we have showing up here, and I can see it here, so I'll just, quickly walk through it. Typically, what's first done is a feasibility study, and that's a desktop study. So you take the data that you have available to you, you don't go out and do any field work, and you just take a look and see whether both the hydrogeology makes sense, that's kind of usually my role in it, and then whether there's excess 
surface water supply or groundwater supply. That's often what Charles brings to the party when we're working together. And so if you think that the site is feasible and you know this costs usually thirty or forty thousand dollars to do that kind of job, it's not too too much money, then at that point you would move forward to a field testing program. And that might mean you already have wells in place that you can go test or do additional logging of to try to prove out the hydrogeology. Or it may be like in the case of the Edwards where we were, there was, it was brackish, no one had ever drilled a well there. So we had to do a pretty extensive field testing program in order to prove to ourselves that it was actually had a good chance of working. And if you pass the field testing portion, again, you're spending more money now, then you get to the pilot phase where you drill an actual ASR well and you recharge it and you perform what's called cycle testing. And the cycle testing is an important part of getting your full TCEQ permit, or at least it's certainly very helpful in, in demonstrating to TCEQ that it's going to operate and that it's going to operate safely and you're not going to endanger anybody by pulling water into the system you know, that, that shouldn't be, that isn't potable or, or could be harmful. And if that pilot, that demonstration well works, then at that point you have a decision to make on whether you want to build out the well field. Basically, you add wells to the well field that are very similar to the pilot well, and you can expand your capability at that point. And one of the real advantages of ASR is it's not a very costly upfront uh, um, type of water supply strategy in the sense you can start with that one well. And if you decide at that point, I need 10 times that capacity, you can add that much capacity. If you need two times, and you can do it throughout the years, and so you're not spending you know, the billions on a water treatment plant right up front. So that is one of the attractive parts of ASR. So with that said, I wanted to turn to the panelists, uh, talk to, to Charles and, and, and Brian especially, about whether this approach was used in your projects and did you find it to be you know, a, a good approach? Did you want to skip steps? Did it make any sense? So Brian, do you want to talk about Ruby Ranch to start with? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, if we think back to where this came about from the idea of Ruby Ranch's ASR, we'd have to sort of, in hindsight, be able to go and look through this list and this chart and say, oh, yeah, we did this and we did that. But it sort of came about, as I mentioned, from these studies that the Barton Springs District had been doing for many years on, on the Trinity aquifers and looking at, you know, with multi-port wells, looking at how the Trinity related to the Edwards there had been thoughts in the past that, well, there's some connection there. If you pump heavily from the Trinity, it might influence the Edwards. And so if you were injecting into the Trinity, that might then find its way into the Edwards. But all of our studies with these multi-port wells and other, other, other studies showed, well, there's a pretty good disconnect. There's some uh, aquitards in there. So we're not seeing, at least in, within our district, any potential for movement, even long faults, that that water is not moving there. So with that, we you know, started thinking, well, ASR could work somewhere or other, maybe the saline Edwards or you know, Edwards into, you know, using Edwards water, injecting into the Trinity. Then we had the perm a permittee, Ruby Ranch, which is a subdivision of only a couple hundred houses, and they were limited in what they could pump from their Edwards well. It wasn't a really good, great producing Edwards well, and at that time we'd put in some policies that limited additional pumping from, from the Edwards. So they, they came to us for a permit for Trinity. And that water was not the best quality, but they were blending it and delivering it to the houses. Uh, so that was all working. And as we started looking at what they had done, and we're thinking, well, they have got an Edwards well right next to Trinity. Maybe they'd be willing to, you know, one day just kind of inject some of that Edwards water in there just as a little test. So, so we were already beyond the feasibility study at that point, and they, they had a very forward-looking board of directors for that worked with the, the water company that, that did the servicing for them. And they, they got interested in it and I guess could see where this could go. And so very, very little cost. They, they connected a pipe from their storage tank that had Edwards water and their Trinity well was only about 50 feet away. So they ran that pipe and then ran it down into the Trinity well. And there you had it, you had an ASR system. And they'd actually had been doing that already because they needed to flush that pipe periodically with very fresh water so they weren't getting corrosion of the steel pipe from, from the, the, the Trinity water that was there. So at some point, they had actually been doing a little bit of injection testing and they didn't realize it. And we <laughs> talked to them and said, well, why don't you just leave that valve open for a while? So we got together and did a little 50,000 gallon injection and think, well, is that water going to come back up? Is it not going to go in? And, 
well, if you, you know, if you have a functioning aquifer, it'll probably go in, you can inject. So we did that and, uh, and that worked. So we went and then stepped up to about 400,000 gallons and that was working and we were doing sampling, look at our, you know, what is the water quality, any issues with that, and of course looking at arsenic. And things just started rolling and we ended up with, you know, working together with Ruby Ranch, going through four cycles of, you know, from very small initially to about nine to 11 million gallons injected over the later cycles. And so that was when the whole permitting process started with, uh, with us and with TCQ. And I think we can follow a lot more on the details of the, of the system as we move into some of these other portions of the discussion. I would like to hear from Charles. I mean, this seems like, Brian, that you guys kind of were already, you had a, an existing well, you didn't really have to do the field testing, so you guys kind of skipped right to the end with that project. In some ways, that's where you could kind of find some way, oh, I guess when we did this, that fits in there, but we weren't following that, just kind of, there was a study we need to do and the logical steps that you would take for that. Cool. And Charles, what was your experience with it? Well, I'd have to say we were very deliberate with the process. And, you know, one of the hurdles you have to overcome uh, when you use that is trying to convince your ratepayers to invest in something that they're really not going to see the benefit from, from for several years. Um, you know, and that's if it proves to be feasible. But I think the real advantage is uh, by going through the stepwise process, your outcome is a lot more predictable. Uh, starting at, at the very beginning with the, the, the desktop analysis, looking at uh, what data has been already gathered in that area, identifying uh, good locations where you have a, are, are able to secure your bubble, uh, looking at uh, the uh, geology of the area. But then that, that next phase, the actual field testing, was what, where we really saw the big benefit. So we, we did a, a wireline core, which is an investment, but it proved to be really beneficial for us down the road. Um, it, it gave us a, a lot better indication of what the, the geochemistry in that formation was, what the geology was. Uh, later on, uh, when we ran into some uh, productivity issues in the well. We actually pull, pulled those core samples out and were able to determine if uh, acidization was going to be uh, a, a good process in this situation. And, uh, you know, so there are a lot of benefits, a lot of things that we learned just from doing that, that wireline core. Uh, when we did the monitoring well during that phase, it gave us a lot better information about the water quality, uh, how water is moving. Uh, in that, the productivity that we could expect. So there are a lot of things that we learned during that field testing phase that we were able to carry into that next phase of actually drilling the wells, getting them in place, and uh, uh, you know now we're in the, the demonstration phase of that project. So uh, And we're still going back to the, the research that we did during that field testing period uh, to help us out as we move forward. That's, uh, that's great information, uh, Charles, and I think it kind of moves us nicely into our next section where we're going to talk a little bit more about technical lessons learned on some of these projects. Um, I did want to ask Shauna, you know, there are successes and failures when we're doing these things, and I was curious as to, I know there's a big push in the legislature, a lot of interest in ASR. Do the on-the-ground successes and failures, do they ever make their way back up to the legislature? Are they curious about whether these things oh, are working? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, ASR, like I said, super sexy topic. <laughs> and if you're a water nerd like Representative Larson you know, is, and he uh, loved talking about ASR. And I would talk to Lori a lot, get updates from her, hopefully you know, updating the legislature on their efforts and how hard they were working. And so I do think, you know, a lot of times we go to the Capitol if there's a problem, but going up there to talk about what good you've done, you guys specifically, is also helpful and how well it's worked, especially as a groundwater district kind of being involved. And this is really forward thinking type stuff, which is, I mean, a lot of the members, especially on the Senate Ag Water Rural Committee and the House Natural Resource Committee would love to hear about this sort of thing. But ultimately, I think the most important thing is having a really good relationship with the TCEQ staff in terms of how successful your, pro your application process will be. 
that makes a lot of sense. And, and Brian, I don't know if you want to touch on any, you know, just little things you've learned along the way. And when you're, for instance, anything about the water chemistry or the productivity or clogging or any, any kinds of those things that, that you guys have run into on that Ruby Ranch one. Well, um, I guess, you know, things went, went very smoothly. And, and one thing of, of real interest is how, how low cost it was. I, it was. So low, I really can't give a value. And I don't know, you know, as, as Ruby Ranch went and bought some PVC pipe to connect, make these connections. At some point, they were hiring some engineers and doing a little more and doing a little better connection. But, you know, this was just district staff with, you know, our, our resources. And, you know, we had money for some monitor wells, but they were for broader purposes. So, so you know, the whole Ruby Ranch thing was done for very little cost when you think about some of these bigger systems and you talk about millions and millions of dollars just to even get halfway to getting a system in, in the ground. But I like to think that one of the lessons that was learned from Ruby Ranch was taken up by the city of Buda because they're now in the middle of, of doing an ASR system. I think summer a year ago they installed an injection well right next to their Edwards well. So they have an injection well into the Trinity in the Cow Creek, and they're, they're really duplicating and scaling up what was done at Ruby Ranch. So that still has a ways to go, but we just received a, an application for pilot testing from, from uh, City of Buda just, just the other day. So, so it's moving forward. They'll soon be doing some more injection. They did a little bit of injection testing already, so and things are working. The only, Con concern that's out there that isn't a problem yet, but it, it's, it's arsenic, you know, like many ASR systems, particularly in Florida, that some have been shut down just because arsenic got too high. So we were watching arsenic from the beginning in Ruby Ranch and seeing, well, the native water was, you know, the detection, the amount of arsenic was below the detection level. So that was a good starting point, but then as we started injecting this oxygenated water of the Edwards in there and pumping it back out, we're saying now we're starting to detect you know, just a barely above the detection level for arsenic. And I think by the time they did their fourth cycle, the numbers got up to like five micrograms per liter, which is about half of the MCL for arsenic. So we're wondering what's gonna happen in the future as they inject more. But the idea is they're injecting a lot. They want to push any arsenic that's mobilized back in the aquifer so it doesn't come back out. So the last uh, pump uh, extraction they did just a few months ago came up with about three micrograms per liter. So that was good news Trending for their the system. Right yeah. yeah, yeah, and and even if there was you know higher levels, there, there are things that could be done. Some of them a little cheaper, some of them a little more expensive for reducing arsenic. But so far, it doesn't look like it'll be a problem with the injecting Edwards water into the into the Trinity. And Shauna talked about you know that relationship with with TCEQ, and I think Lori and her group have done a great job. They've put out a couple of research studies with the BEG and with the University of Texas. Some of you all may have seen the presentation by Charles Worth at AGWT, but he did a pretty exhaustive study of kind of the how you go about. It had a very nice flow chart. If you want to go look it up, it's online. But kind of how you go about about mitigating the potential for arsenic being a problem in ASR. So TCEQ is trying to get out ahead of it. They're trying to do some real science ahead of it. I think that, you know, Florida, they feel like they eventually solved the problem, figured out how to, how to not get arsenic in their, in their wells. But I know that's always on people's minds. Texas City, one of the very first ones, one of the very, very first tries we had at ASR in Texas, they had arsenic problems and it basically killed ASR for 10 years. So we don't want to repeat that that kind of a result where it's going to make people think, oh, you know, we got problems with ASR with arsenic. So, sorry, Charles, I'm talking too much. So, <laughs> lessons learned for, from you. We've got a few minutes uh, still on this section here. You're exactly right. And, and going right along with the TCEQ, uh, the, the 5X25 experimental permit, uh, as we found, is not terribly onerous to get, but uh, it is very tightly written. And uh, you have to be prepared for if there's something that happens uh, that's outside of those stipulations uh, that are in the permit uh, to react very quickly in order to get an exception there. We did uh, have a, you know, one or two things that happened during construction that you know, were, were slightly outside of the, the stipulations in there. But they were very easy to work with. Uh, we didn't have any issues. They just wanted to see the science, uh, make sure that there were, were not going to be any issues down the road, and, and they were more than willing to, to move forward with those exceptions. Um, the, uh, oh, 
The full ASR operating permit, on the other hand, seems like it's going to be a little bit more of a challenge just looking at um, uh, water quality, a lot of water quality data, um, a lot of uh, monitoring uh, data as well, and uh, which you know results in more monitoring wells, uh, those sorts of things. So uh, we're doing everything, and, and, it's, and it's right. It's the right thing to do, and we understand why they, they want that. It's their job to protect water quality for, for the citizens. And so it's just a little bit more uh, of a process, we'll say, in order to get that full operating permit. But we're getting there. Um, in terms of uh, just technical lessons learned, I think the biggest one for us is just expect the unexpected. You know, we drilled a monitoring well in the uh, in that same zone all the way through the both both elements of the brackish Edwards with with barely a whiff of H2S 150 feet away we drilled the production well and our meters pegged out and we had to shut down uh, production or, or drilling in order to make sure the conditions were safe and, and that bring in specialty contractor now we were able to respond very quickly to that finish it out case it off uh, you know, that, that zone where we were seeing those high readings. But it's one of those things that you have to be prepared to react to some of these things. We're not expecting it. It happened just 150 feet away. And uh, the other thing was, you know, when we did finish that production well, the productivity was far less than what we were anticipating. And so we started looking at you know, should we acidize this and try to improve the productivity? This is where we pulled the core samples back out. We did some lab analysis on those intervals. Uh, we determined that, yes, that would be a good thing to do there. We acidized the well, and now the product productivity is uh, far greater than what we were expecting. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of good lessons learned from the technical side as we went through the process. One interesting thing that Charles mentioned is working on his experimental well application. And TCQ was, has been so great. Um, Kim is here, and she was awesome working with us on House Bill 720. Um, but that's a whole other part of TCEQ. That's the surface water rights section. So we're working you know, with um, the injection uh, UIC division. But we actually were able to provide input on the experimental well forms and the um, application for full-blown project, the operating um, forms. And um, when we, rep we um, one of my clients is the city of Bryan, and I think we were maybe the first uh, folks coming before them going to do the experimental well form. And for our cycle testing, first phase of the, uh, the ASR project, and we kind of got halfway through it, and we realized, let's just scratch this whole experimental application and just go straight to the full, uh, full project application for this first phase, and then we'll amend that later. Um, and so we really did the work on the front end, which almost, you kind of have to do some of that stuff for the experimental well, especially the recoverability component, just to protect the project. Um, and so that was just a different approach that I thought was interesting that we ultimately took. And I think Brian's a really interesting and special case, and I wish that David were here to talk about it, but I'll just touch on it, where they're putting, planning to put the ASR wells are down dip of their actual well field, and right. this is in the Simsboro, right? So it's like 3,000 feet deep. The wells are expensive, and you have to think pretty carefully if you're going to drill a 3,000-foot well. So the initial demonstration was done with, it, with retrofitting an, another well. They did the demonstration with that well. But what they're really interested in is you can imagine that big well field in Bryan has created a Kona depression in Simsboro. And so the gradients are all running directly to the center of that well field. So if you recharge water kind of on the perimeter of where that Kona depression is, it's going to tend to draw all your recharge water straight towards that well field. So the question of recoverability that, that Shauna brought up, like can you actually get the water back out or has it migrated away from a, your recharge well, it becomes a really important question. And, and so David and, and CDM and Shauna, and they've just done a great job with that. I did a little bit of the modeling, but they've done the heavy lifting on that. It's a really interesting project. So, all right, I'm, I'm running a little late on time here for here. So let's, let's move on, I appreciate it. Um, project management lessons learned. And, and we won't spend too much time on this, but 
I, just being involved with Charles on the MBU project, um, it's certainly been a large and interesting to manage project, Charles. So I just, if you could just touch a little bit about the project management side of things on these. Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah it's, it, project management really, in most cases, comes down to schedule and budget. When you talk about ASR projects, uh, schedule is vital because if you slip, you know, one or two months, it could mean that you miss an entire year in your demonstration phase of your cycle recovery uh, because you're not able to recover during that peak, peak demand season when you need to. So uh, it's, the schedule is always important. On the, the budget side, I, I think it's, it's really more on the contractual side. Um, things happen because we're, when you drill a well, uh, most of the time, there, you don't know 100% what you're going to encounter there. And in our case, that, that happened a, a couple of times. We mentioned the H2S issue, mentioned the productivity issue. Um, it's important to have a contractor allowance uh, in the contractor's uh, contract in order to help to manage some of those things. But it's also beneficial to have a contract contingency that's pre-authorized by uh, the board or the city council, whatever the situation is, so that you know, your general manager, your CEO or director can uh, maneuver more quickly when they do encounter those things. Because the last thing you want is to have a driller sitting idle on site, taking up all of those, uh, those lost days, and, and you know, you're gonna get a bill for that down the road for rental of that equipment. So you wanna be able to maneuver very quickly and that's what we found would be the best approach to, to be able to do that. That makes a lot of sense. And I did want to touch just channeling David uh, Smith a little bit here. Some of these ASR wells, ASR wells are a little more complicated than a standard water well. So you need your driller to know what they're doing. And so the procurement process, trying to identify qualified drillers, especially going to 3,000 feet or doing the very large diameter well that we did at, at, at New Braunfels, you really have to think about your procurement process and make sure that you're not just going low bid and you make sure that your driller has the experience. You know, they don't necessarily have to have drilled an ASR well, but they need to have the level of sophistication and be used to the kind of equipment that's gonna be used so that you can create a well that's gonna be successful. Because if you spend three million on a well and you clog it right away or you collapse the screen or you know, all those things you guys know that can happen with wells, it's double with ASR. So just take great care in that procurement process, I think is the advice coming from David on that. So uh, let's see, anything more? Shauna, you already kind of talked about best practices for permitting. I mean, that's definitely a project management thing. And you talked about skipping the, the 5X25 and going to the full. Could you just talk a little bit more about that? Because I wasn't totally sure I understood yeah, where we you went, went with that. Yeah, we went straight for the full application. Um, and David Smith did a great job working on all the data for that, but the thing that I came in and made his life pretty miserable for a while, I think, <laughs> um, and reviewing his work on the application while the data was so robust, you know, you really have to tie the specific data um, with the actual rule or policy that it is trying to meet or prove for your project. So connecting the dots, while that sounds simple, it's actually a little more difficult. Um, so, you know, I know that some of you technical folks don't love having a lawyer involved and watching over you, but, you know, we are helpful in the sense that you really do wanna have your application ready to go and have a very good connection and communication with TCQ staff throughout the development of the application process prior to turning it in, your first draft. And so you wanna you know, talk with them, visit with them, say, is this gonna be sufficient, and talk, get their feedback, but it's really important to make sure that you connect the dots. And I think the biggest challenge with that project in making sure that we were meeting all of the requirements that the policy and the rules require was the demonstration of recoverability. And really saying, this is the percentage we're taking out and this is what we're gonna leave in, and this is how much this is gonna, this is how it's gonna work, and these are the ratios, and that sounds simple, but in reality, um, it's a little more difficult, and I, it's a lot of repetition, but you gotta do it. That's, 
Good advice. And one more thing occurred to me, Charles, thinking about working with a municipality, they often budget annually. You've got a project that's maybe going to last five years. You know, how do you kind of try to work your way through making sure that you're getting the, the money and the flexibility you need going through that five-year process? Well, you have to provide pretty accurate um, projections on what your needs are going to be. And and uh, you know, looking five years out, it's it's hard to say sometimes because you do run into things that aren't anticipated. Uh, but whenever you do see those, you need to make those adjustments very quickly. We we work very closely with uh, both uh, Victoria and New Braunfels to make sure that they had a good idea of what their needs were going to be for that five years in order to get through full well-filled expansion. And you know, when things come up like you know, COVID, when everyone's uncertain about, uh, hey, we're, we're, we're not selling as much water, uh, what are we going to do to make up the revenue stream? You know, sometimes you have to react to that and you have to make adjustments to that plan. And, and so I think just working closely with the clients to make sure that they understand what your needs are going to be is, is it benefits the project overall. Great. All right, so we're going to do our next section. I think we're at 40 minutes now. We're going to do a looking forward section. So what I'd like to do is have the panelists just provide a few closing remarks addressing various looking forward topics. I'm suggesting a few, but if you guys have others, that's fine. I think, Shauna, I would really be curious to know what the current climate is at the Capitol on ASR. I didn't see it, you know, they didn't talk about it specifically. That doesn't mean it's not on their mind. I did think, can ESR be thought of as a resiliency strategy? Because resiliency is a big deal with the, with the funds that are flowing down right now. I think that the capital uh, is of the mindset that, you know, we've given Texas a really robust uh, framework for the utilization of ASR technology. So let's see it implemented, which we definitely are seeing. Um, and TCEQ has done a great job of doing the rulemaking that is in line with that the law that we passed to promote that. Um, I think ASR, I think the, ro the roadblock we're at now is getting water suppliers to utilize it as a water management strategy. Um, I think there's an educational curve that needs to be met there. Um, we worked really closely with uh, Representative Larson's office in starting this new uh, uh, nonprofit organization, uh, Texas ASR, in 2019 to promote ASR and kind of be a liaison between the capital and water suppliers and utilizing this project. COVID hit, so it was kind of put on hold, but hopefully that will get going again soon and we have a lot of support from the capital from Perry's office on that front. That's great, that's great. Um, uh, Charles or Brian, uh, what do you see, any challenges that could slow adoption of ASR in the next five years? I mean. Challenges, Brian? Do you see anything up there? I mean, you're the regulator. Do you see any regulatory challenge well, in your district? I'm a, I'm a science guy that works for a regulatory agency. <laughs> okay. Well, so, you're repping them right now. So I'll, you know, try not to get too much into the into the regulatory <laughs> side. But, Caveat heard, yes. But but anyway, from the, just the logistics point of view, and everybody that looks into ASR very far at all just thinks about, hey, this is a great idea and concept, but you have to have some excess water from some source that you have to put into some some kind of aquifer, and there's all kinds of obstacles there. You know, with drought, all of a sudden some of this excess water just might go away. In some cases, it doesn't if the water's coming from a reliable source. But you need to be able to have mixed sources. And the city of Buda is sort of an ideal situation. They're using Edwards water initially, but they have plans to take some of the surface water that they're being piped in. And they've even went and changed some of the rules, you know, with the legislature to allow for injection of potable water through the Edwards, it, with the Edwards rules in the past wasn't wasn't uh, wasn't permitted, and yeah, and yet that just changed for a small area. So I think something that's limiting is still the Edwards rules. Yeah, are they're meant to protect the ed freshwater Edwards, but they kind of put a blanket rule over it. Doesn't matter. It's just it's Edwards. So and particularly with, with NBU, they really had to struggle, you know, with that. As we look forward into other options of of using more of the saline Edwards, you know, we we have that that issue still at hand that might be out of that area that's been 
allowed by the legislature to, to do this injection through the Edwards. Yeah, it's interesting. The you know, Buda got that. Charles MBU was able to, to obtain a I call it a carve out. I don't know if that's the right word for Perfect. it for being able to inject in the saline Edwards. I mean, you're the you're the only lobbyist up here, Shauna. Can you talk about the process of of how if you know I don't want to say City of Austin that's a hard one, but somebody like that could get a similar kind of uh, a bill passed that would allow them to go through the Edwards. I think as well. it starts with getting Senator Campbell to carry your bill because she's the one who's got. I mean, I mean, not really, but she her bill has been the one to pass for both of those efforts um, with Buda and uh, New Braunfels. Uh, so yeah, you know, we have the, basically, the Edwards is special. And so if you want to do an ASR project outside of the Edwards, great, go ahead, do it. But if you want to do it within the Edwards, either through or into or through the Edwards, you need your carve out. Um, you need to work with your your legislator. Um, we saw that the Buda effort was um, started in 2017, and there were a lot of people at that table working on that bill. Um, we finally got it to a good place, but it was a little bit too far into the session, and so my advice would be work far in advance with the mm -hmm. stakeholders before session starts and get a draft ready to go. Don't just file something and then have to work on it get your work done before session. Talk to your member before session, get everybody on board. Um, though, so that finally passed in 2019. Then we had the New Braunfels bill pass in 2019, both Campbell's bills. Okay. Um, so it's, both, it's good to have both chambers involved. Um, but yeah, unless you fall under the Buta bill, which is a project through the Edwards into the Trinity, that's that there's like some wiggle room there, but the new, the new Braunfels legislation is very specific to New Braunfels. So you would still need a carve out for most projects into the Edwards. Okay, okay. And Charles, I mean, just working with municipalities or other folks that might use this as a strategy, I mean, going forward, do you see any special challenges in trying to convince folks of the viability of this, if, if it is viable, or trying it as a strategy? Well, I, I think always, you know, I've, I've never had uh, a, a, a client or a, or a city manager or anyone that has said to me, cost doesn't matter. <laughs> um, I think cost is always going to matter and it's always going to be an investment. And so you have to be able to uh, justify why you need to make that investment. And I, I think maybe that's the biggest challenge. I, I think from a resiliency standpoint, there are there's a lot of federal funding that is kind of trickling down now for resiliency and ASR as a water supply would, would count toward that. So it is an available funding mechanism. But um, there, there's a lot of interest in ASR. And, and I think just the, the, the sheer stamina of, of, of this group hanging out with us on the, the, the last morning of the conference to, to hear about that is, uh, is maybe a testament to that. There's a lot of a, uh, interest in ASR not just a, as a water supply strategy, but also as a water resiliency mm -hmm. strategy. So I uh, think we know things can happen during droughts. Uh, we were counting on a certain amount of water being available, and when it's not, what do you do? And so from a resiliency standpoint, this really gives you a hedge against something happening to one of your water supplies. For New Braunfels in particular, They've done a great job over the last few years of diversifying their water supply portfolio. The groundwater, surface water, they're getting uh, water uh, from the, the Guadalupe Mid Basin project. It's going to be coming online soon. A lot of different sources Edwards, fresh water, as well as Trinity uh, groundwater. So, but what happens when one of those supplies uh, is down for whatever reason? Now, we didn't think a whole lot about this, right, until uh, Snowmageddon or, or, or Snowvid or whatever you want to call it. You know, when you have four straight days of uh, sub-freezing sub temperatures and, and, you know, we can't produce water or our, our water supplies are not available. So then what do you do? So really, they... Um, they're very interested in the resiliency of that water supply, of their portfolio, and what they can do to make it better. And ASR is gonna be a big piece of that to make sure that it continues to be resilient. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that, Charles. And I wanna use the last minute we have on this section before we jump to uh, questions from the audience to uh, 
to just talk about what role GCDs might have going forward in the next couple of years. I think there have been a couple of GCDs that recognize the, the potential value of ASR to help preserve water inside their districts. So it's a strategy by which you can either, if you have a depleted aquifer, maybe you could do managed aquifer recharge and you can increase the amount of water in your depleted aquifer, or just by encouraging ASR, being able to conjunctively use surface water in that way, um, you can preserve the water in your district. And, and I'm, I don't want to sing the praises of Dirk Aaron too much because they do it enough around here, but uh, he did a great job in Bell County of getting a consortium together with the, the county judge and putting together a really nice uh, set of basically workshops to educate the municipalities and other folks in that district on what the benefits of ASR could be. And, you know, he's not the regulator because he doesn't regulate ASR, but he recognized the benefit, and I think that was that was really a, a good step and something that could be replicated. And with that, I'll go to questions. Sure. So I'll first look to the audience to see if there are any questions before I read the ones that came in on the app. All right, so, um, and it actually goes exactly to where you kind of wrapped up there, Neil. Someone was asking a little bit more about the interaction between ASR and the rule of capture, and I would add on to that. What about areas that don't have a GCD and issues regarding somebody taking the water that's being stored? How is that all resolved in the interplays there? So when we did House Bill 655, the the issue of trespass was definitely discussed at length, but it was something we did not want to put into legislation. So at the end of the day, there's, there's no liability. TCEQ has no liability on that front, but you know, at the end of the day, if you don't protect your own project, because the law just requires that your acreage is contiguous with, for your wells, but your bubble could potentially go beyond your track of land, your project could and your neighbor is definitely able to suck that water out under the rule of capture. And we haven't really seen the courts make a decision on that front. Um, maybe there'll be a case on ASR in, in the future, but um, that's something that has been yet to be determined. So the rule of capture definitely applies. And I'm just gonna add on my own question with that. Is, are there any strategies that these projects are utilizing to try to avoid that from happening? Yeah, and, and you know, in, in urban areas, uh, it, it's maybe less of a risk just because the, the cities usually have uh, zoning and, and regulations that would prohibit uh, drilling of a well in, in, in those types of areas. So you're, they're, if they're storing underneath land that they control, it's a lot easier to secure that. Uh, with New Braunfels, you know, we were out on the, the outskirts, and, and certainly that was a, a bit of a a concern, but this goes back to that first part of the process where you're doing that desktop analysis, you're gathering all of that information, identifying where the right site is. It's not just based on uh, the geology, but it's also based on how can we protect that. And where we ended up putting the ASR site in New Braunfels is on the municipal airport site, because that is all protected land. And we could pretty well keep the bubble managed within that airport site. And Brian, can you imagine a scenario where you would have different spacing rules for ASR wells in order to try to keep <laughs> folks from, you know, putting their straw in the bubble? Well, yeah, well, this uh, certainly gets complicated with all the options that, you know, relate to the regulations of a groundwater district, what people can and can't do. So there's certainly some room there that a groundwater district could restrict things, you know, say in the case of of Ruby Ranch, if somebody, one of the neighbors there came and said, well, they wanted to tap into that bubble. They just wanted water. They didn't want to get it from their normal source. Uh, they'd have to come to us for a permit to drill and, and maybe it'd be uh, an exempt well, but I, I don't know at what point we'd, have, we'd be able to just say, well, you can't do that. But if it was an exempt well, I don't know why someone would drill an 1100 foot well to get water they already have. Yeah. And you know the, the cost of, of that, and that's such a small amount of water that you know the ASR, uh, system wouldn't really be too worried about a domestic well or two. I think it's more about a big pumper coming in saying, yeah, I'm really going to steal that water right. and get away with it. Fair enough. And then there was another question, and it ties back to our previous speaker, about the viability and 
issues associated with potentially putting treated produced water into ASR? Well, wow. I mean, you, I mean, Shauna, you said that, you know, we, we don't, we're no more restrictive than EPA, but basically you cannot put water in the aquifer that's not at least as good as the right. aquifer. So you have to demonstrate that you're not mixing your, your recharge water with water that's better than the, the water that's in the aquifer itself. So that produced water, you'd have to be putting it back in an aquifer that's pretty bad or high sal highly saline. The bar would be pretty high. You're still going to have to meet all the requirements that TCEQ has on water quality. So if it's produced water and it's been treated or not, uh, they're not. If you're trying to get an ASR project, um, you're going to have to that that specific kind of UIC pro permit. Um, there's other UIC permits that could be utilized, but um, you would have to meet the water quality standards. Okay, wonderful. Well, let's give this panel a round of applause. Really appreciate you being here.